it massively shows you how disciplined you need to be to do well, <coughs> you know? And that's the same as business. Yeah. To do well, you need to be disciplined. Yeah. Or to do better than the next man, you need to be disciplined. And with boxing, you know, the sport itself doesn't hold any prisoners. You know, you don't train, it shows. Yeah. You don't go running, it shows. Yeah. You'll get beat. Welcome back, everyone, to the Stephen Sully study. I'm here once again at Woodbury House, and I've got another wicked guest in front of me, Alfie Best Jr. Thank you very much, brother, for coming on board. Nice one. No worries at all, Steve. It's cool. A pleasure to be here. Wicked. Two things are my passion. Business and boxing. Training, but specifically boxing. And part of the reason why I wanted to interview you, you tick both of those boxes and many other boxes as well. On top of that... Uh, I think it was two years ago now, I had the pleasure, and it was, uh, when I say, and I'm being very genuine about this, it was an absolute pleasure to interview your dad. Um, like I mentioned off, off air, he's someone that I already felt like I knew, but that was the first time I met him, because the way he talks is so simple, and he's got such good advice. He's, all, he's a bit like a father figure, you know, in, in some ways. Um, I am on my, you know, very, very early stages of being a business person. I'm 35 years of age. I've got so, I've got a very long way to go. And when I was just had a very short time with him, he gave me such good advice. And um, yeah, he just said to me, look, I think you should interview my son. I think you two would get along really well. Hence why I reached out to you. So thank you for your time, mate. Yeah, no problem at all. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's talk about my number one thing I, I love in life. I know you're, you're, you're a boxer. Um, so when I... Uh, started boxing at 14 years of age I boxed for a club called Bromley and Downham um, amateur club I had about 10 amateur fights then I went to Kettles uh, which is in Alpenton and it, I had three unlicensed fights there and then I moved on to Ross Minter's um, uh, league called the Queensbury League and I had a fight about a year and a bit ago um, and I feel like boxing really for me because I wasn't such a clever kid at school I was pretty shit with the grades and everything else boxing gave me that confidence I know f fully well that you've obviously boxed and stuff um, how, how, how big is boxing for you you know like you know, following it or doing it or you know you, you, you know, do you have a passion behind it absolutely I love boxing from the bottom of my heart I've done it from such a young age Stephen was I mean far back as I can remember and it's the only thing that me and my dad done together. It's the only time he actually said, right. Did he train you as yes, well? Yes, he did. Yeah. When I was a kid, he did, like, <clears throat> all through. I did, he didn't start training me, but when I started having a couple of fights, I'm sure he just looked and thought, maybe he can do a better job, which it worked <laughs> very well, you know. But to be fair with you, the, the problem was, is that we never had no home life then. Everything was boxing, 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 boxing. It was actually military. Uh, at one stage, you know, mm. it was it was quite difficult because, you know, my training was up my back all the time. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, mm. we, we didn't have time to breathe, you know. Uh, but it's a massive thing. I've got a mad passion for it. My dad loves it. And it's one of the only things, really, we've got massively in common yeah. that we both like. Even such as today, we sit down and watch the boxing together. Like, it had a big impact on my life. It's taught me a hell of a lot. And I'm sure anybody that walks in the boxing gym... It teaches a hell of a lot. Yeah. And I don't just mean in a boxing gym. I mean in life in general. Yeah, for sure. So, like, I've got a son. He's only two and a bit years of age. And uh, I'm, I'm already saying to my missus, I said, look, on a Sunday, I go down to the boxing booth gym. Um, you know, Adam Martin yes, down there and uh, Adam Booth and stuff. And I go down there and spar the guys down there. And I said to my missus, she's a bit against it, but I'm slowly bringing her around. I'm saying, look, let's get, my, let's get Mason, our son, down there. Because even if he doesn't go on to be become a, a pro, what it will give him is the characteristics, the personality, the resilience, the the fighting instinct to go on and push on in his life. And he can transfer that skill into business. He can transfer it into another sport. He can transfer it into anything he wants. Would you say there's like parallels and there's common kind of traits that boxers or athletes have when it comes down to business or pursuing something? It it massively shows you how disciplined you need to be to do well, you know? And that's the same as business. Yeah. To do well, you need to be disciplined. Yeah. Or to do better than the next man, you need to be disciplined. And with boxing, you know, the sport itself doesn't hold any prisoners. You know, you don't train, it shows. Yeah. You don't go running, it shows. Yeah. You'll get beat, yeah. you know? And it was one of the worst things in the world. I, can't, I cannot explain the feeling I used to get when I lost. Like, I felt... I can't even explain the feeling, but I felt bad for days. Yeah. You know, and I actually lost my first two fights as an amateur. Um, 
And I, like I say, I, I couldn't get my head round it. Like, what was going wrong? And I trained ever so hard. And I do believe the amateurs is a little bit corrupt. Mm, you know? Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think so. I, I do also believe the professional boxing is a little bit corrupt. Maybe people have different opinions on fights. Maybe people have different... Uh, they like different styles. But still, I still find it very corrupt. But still, the reason you have to be so disciplined is because you don't want to leave it down to the judges. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. mainly for professionals. Yeah. But still, in any case, like, to win, you don't just need to nick it. You need to win, mm. you know? You need to box out of your skin. And if you're unfit, you can't do that. Yeah. You know, so I just think it shows you so much discipline and it teaches you not to be a bully, yeah. actually, as it, which is a massive, massive, massive thing, you know, because people that don't go to boxing gyms, you know, or want to act hard, etc. when you go to a boxing gym and you find out how hard it is to keep getting punched in the mouth, you know, you don't want to start going punching people in the mouth. Do you understand what I'm saying? Definitely. So going back to um, my, my first amateur gym, Bromley and Downham, um, they're very, it's very, very close to my heart, that gym, because like I said, when I, when I was 14 years of age, I walked into that gym and I was so intimidated um, there was, you know, guys bashing the bag and people sparring and I had never done boxing in my life before. Uh, my mum and dad wasn't into it. I was more into like playing squash and football and things like that. I went down there and the first few sessions or the first few weeks I was really intimidated. But as I started pushing on, I started feeling it was like a bit of like a family down there. And I started getting, I started getting a lot of confidence. And um, anyway, long story short, I personally believe part of the reason why I've stepped into business is because of that boxing club. It gave me the confidence. So yeah, just I was just you know sec second in what you were saying about boxing. You it, know? But listen, it gives you a, a great like training in general. It's the best type of training. You feel so fit, like coming out of a boxing gym. You feel like you've accomplished something. You feel yeah. like you've achieved something. When you come out, you feel like now I deserve to relax. Yeah, you know, and as you'll understand because you've been in many boxing gyms. There's no like, you know, tell me another sport or tell me to anything that you could go and get in and actually try and punch the grandmother out of someone and then get out and be friends and start talking about what you're going to have for tea or where you're yeah. going and then the next day do the same again. Yeah, it, do, yeah, it doesn't happen in any other sport. And as I was, as I was going to get to, so um, thanks to Richard and uh, Reg Foster, who were uh, the owners of the gym, and there was one particular guy down there, a guy called Sam, Sam Webb, he ended up, I think he won the ABAs. He then, then turned over to pro and he became um, British champion. I think he got by, beat by a guy called Prince some, someone. Can't remember, can't remember the name now. But anyway, um, I lost connection with him. He, he was like a, a bit about four or five years older than me. And i got to be honest, again, I was, even though he was never rude to me or he was never nasty, he was never nasty to anyone. Boxers are not, not normally like that. But just because he was powerful, because he was a great boxer, I didn't want to go near him. Anyway, um, many years later, when I got into business for myself, I reached back out to him and said, look, you may remember me, may not, but I've got to thank you because you gave me so much confidence. Because even if you didn't really speak to me, just the way you was and very professional and all the sacrifice and your hard work and your dedication, it gave me a lot of inspiration. And what I started doing at that point is sponsoring him for his fights. So he used to fight down a, a club called uh, iBox, um, which is in Bromley Common in, in Kent. And I remember just, just saying to him that I really, really... I can't thank you enough. And he was a bit shocked because he was like, I, I didn't even say nothing to you. And I said, that's the point. It's just the, the way you was, like the confidence that you had, it gave me the confidence to think, you know what, I can go on and, and do something. And what you were saying about when you go to a boxing gym and you can spar and you can train next to someone, it gives you the respect for that other person. Even if you don't particularly like that other person, because you both are sacrificing or training together or fighting each other, you have that kind of respect. And I believe that... In this country, we've got a big problem with knife crime, okay? I know it's been a little bit changed recently because of COVID, no one's going out so much, but typically speaking, there's a lot of gangs, there's a lot of like knife crime and, and drugs and stuff. I believe if they brought back, back boxing into schools, I believe pockets of that crime will come down. So my vision for the future, when I've cracked it, so to speak, and I've made what I've needed to, to do in business, is try and force the hand of the government to make sure that they bring it back in because... I think it's crazy they're not, not bringing boxing into schools. So do I. Absolutely. Um, I don't understand why it's not in schools. You know, I, I do believe that maybe they should have a choice. Yeah. You know, whether they want to do it or they don't. But even the training, you know, like f boxers, as in men, are gentlemen. Like, yeah. have you ever met a boxer that's rude? They're, they're, listen, there's going to be one or two. 
uh, out of them. Some but, exceptions to the know, rule, yeah. But they're mo- mainly gentlemen. Like, I've never seen a kid or even myself stop to a boxer and gone, <clears throat> could I have a photo? And them said no. Yeah. Or turned you down. They are gentlemen, you know. They live in the real world. Like, regardless to how well they do, they're always very, very, very grounded. And I think some kids and some people need to learn this. Yeah. Not only because of knife crime, as much as I'd love it to stop, but start there with that. Do you know what I'm saying? Because to be fair with you, do I think it would stop knife crime? To be fair, there would be another area where it would expand. Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Like we would have solved that one thing and then there would be another group of children or another group of teenagers. Do the same else. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, But still, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant idea for, for both of them reasons, for the, for the reason that you've just pointed out there yourself. And like I say, because it teaches you so much more than school could ever teach somebody. Yeah, because um, so when I had the last Queensbury f- fight, I raised money for them because the the club was struggling. Um, and it, and if if the club would have gone down, it would have not only meant the, the the boxing club goes down, but they're attached to a youth centre, and the youth centre would have gone down. And the youth centre and the boxing club opens two or three times a week, so it meant that all those kids. From females to males to older kids to younger kids, they would have been back out out in the streets. And no doubt, crime, whether that's knife crime, whether that's gangs, whether that's violence or robberies or whatever, would have gone up. Not saying those particular kids would have done it, but it just meant more and more people out out in that particular community. And when they're bored, what are they going to do? They're going to find things to do. And sometimes those things to do are not the right things. And there's been some statistics. When I was raising the money for the club, when I was looking at certain areas... When they put, put, introduce an amateur club or a boxing club in the area, crime does come down from, from, from the younger generation. So I just think it creates that family sort of mentality. It creates that hard work, dedication environment, and it creates that respect. And I think it gives people something to do. And on top of that, the, the obvious thing is, if a kid is going now two or three times a week, or if not more, and they become shattered after training, what are they going to do? They're going to go home, eat a bit of grub, watch a bit of TV and go to bed rather than get home from school or maybe their work that they're not really passionate about and find themselves maybe in the wrong crowd. Mm-hmm. That's just my take on it. You know, I'm quite passionate about boxing because it's not just about the sport itself, it's about the community it builds around it, you know, the infrastructure. Well, it, 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 it's obviously a recipe that's worked because I could name a couple of boxers off the top of my head that was heading down the, re- uh, down the wrong road, took up boxing, and now they're elite athletes, mm. you know? Yeah. So the recipe does work. It does get kids off the street. It yeah. does. It does. You know. Um, but it's it's it is it is a hard sport. And the thing is, like I say, you do have to be disciplined. But again, maybe if they don't want to bring boxing into schools, because I understand maybe it would cost a lot of money. Maybe they don't want the injuries. But to be fair, changing the subject a little bit, I used to play football as a kid, and I had more injuries playing football <coughs> than I ever did boxing. Yeah. I broke my nose once, that was it, and I got a cut across yeah. my eye. But that's not, you know, like I had a, an injury from football, which could have been life-changing. I yeah. torn a ligament in my leg, you know, I could have had a permanent limp. Yeah. You know, I never ever had that problem with boxing. I think there's a misconception, certainly with people who've never done it. They just think it's violent, Absolutely. they think it's blo- bloody. And, and the reality is, it's the most, coining your phrase, most gentleman sport out there, in my Absolutely. opinion. You know? Absolutely. And if you... Like I say, I think it'd be very difficult for the government to bring boxing into schools, to be fair. I think it'd be very, very difficult. But what I do think they should do is let's say there's a school, for example, let's just say down the road in Leicester Square, the local boxing club maybe come once a month and do a trial. Or even after school, you know, bring all the gloves, do a bit of pads and see the ones that like it and the ones that don't. Because, you know, yeah, right, we'll all go there after school today. Instead of us going, you know, okay, egging, playing knockdown ginger or whatever kids yeah. do, we go to the boxing club at the bottom of the road instead of finding mischief. Because there's a saying that my dad taught me and I, I did it just clicked so well. The devil makes work for idle hands. And I just, it clicked so well. I thought you are 100% right. And Definitely. If, if anybody out there don't understand what he means by that, is what he means is when you're not doing nothing, you find <coughs> bad stuff to do. Yeah, you know I'm guilty of that myself. You know I've like you know I've had nothing to do. You know gone out, caused a bit of mischief. Like I'm sure we've all done it. Definitely, I can, yeah, I, mean, I, I definitely it's, it's have. A, it's a brilliant saying, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so talking about boxing and you, uh, is there any future with yourself getting back in the ring? Um, 
Absolutely, a hundred, a hundred percent. To be quite honest with you, what happened was I had, I turned over as a pro. I had one fight, completely different game to the amateurs. I had a five year layoff, uh, and to be fair with you, I, 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 it was my biggest, biggest, biggest regret was was stopping boxing. But when I come out of school, I stopped school very young to come out and start working. Going to school and coming and going training was one thing, which was you know let's say nine to three, but now it's eight, half, seven to six, s- seven, going home, getting washed showers straight to the gym, it, it was completely writing me off, you know, I, mm. I, I actually couldn't cope, Yeah, you know, like personally I couldn't, I'm not saying that's for everybody, but me personally, mentally it was draining, physically I was draining, I wasn't enjoying it, Yeah, and if you don't enjoy it, you know, don't bother, you could end up getting hurt. Of course, of you know? course. And uh, yeah, I do see a future, I turned over, I had one professional fight, um, <coughs> which was in 2017. I yep. won that. Um, I did go to have another fight, but I, I, I broke my ankle, you know, or I, I, I wouldn't say I broke it, I fractured it, but, you know, still very difficult to train on. Yeah. Um, and then to be honest with you, I got so tangled up with work and things like that. And then on top of that, I was going to fight at the beginning of 2020 and then COVID come round. You yeah, know, I was training. I was ready. I was fit. I had all my licenses in order. Yeah, and it didn't come round to it, obviously, because of uh, because of the circumstances. Yeah, but when everything gets lifted, one one hundred percent, I'll be back in the ring. Yeah, lovely. Well, I'm thirty five years of age, which I think is quite a lot older than you. And I've said to myself, uh, I've got to have you know a good a good five more fights uh, at least before uh, I get a bit too old. Yeah. But you know what? I think boxers now are going up over 40. You know, they're going yeah. to 42, 43, 44, 45 sometimes. Mm. I think if you can keep yourself active, you can keep yourself fit, you know, you, you're eating the right stuff and, and doing all the recovery stuff, I think you can preserve your body Absolutely. for quite, quite a while, you know? Uh, 100%, I agree. Definitely. So um, this is what I said to your dad as well. As being a young kid going into the boxing gyms and then going from gym to gym to do like in-house sparring and stuff, I've been around all my life travellers. And one thing I know about travellers is they're fucking tough people. Mm. They're very respectful people. Mm. They're family orientated. And I always felt, thought to myself, that's the perfect recipe for being in business as well. And I can see when I was saying to you earlier about I felt like I knew your dad. Mm. I've never met him, but I've, I've seen him on TV on BBC. I've listened to some of his, in, his interviews. In actual fact, the guy who got me into podcasting is a guy called Rob Moore. I know him pretty well. They actually do a lot of the... Um, uh, editing for, for the podcast for us and I listened to your dad on there I was like Jesus that's the guy I watched one day on, on the BBC and then somehow I, I, I you know, contacted him went down to his offices Wildcrest Park Homes mm-hmm. and interviewed him on site and I just said like I just feel like because I've been around the, the community of travellers and also boxing and then I'm trying to get into business I felt like I really knew him and anyway, so do you think like those, 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 all those characteristics I just mentioned, that's like the perfect recipe, the perfect foundation to go into business and really develop a brand or cultivate an audience and, you know, and, and become a successful business person? Would you say that's been instilled into you as a young, young kid? Um, business, you know, has been installed into me, like, you know, business is, mentioned in my household that you know there's no family meals without business getting brought up you know there's not just a general how are you conversation without business getting Mm. brought up and that's just how it is in my house and I'm sure it's like that with a lot of travelers you know Mm. we're we're an entrepreneurial race of people very much so it's uh you know and and that that I speak for for 90% of them and 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 absolutely confident you know if um I I feel like you know what you learn, I don't know how you learn it, but it must be throughout your family, the confidence, you know, to go out there and get what you want. Because sometimes when, you, when you're when you from a, let's call it a conventional family, they're a little bit reserved. And okay, being reserved sometimes is fine, but you need to be confident if you're going to succeed in life, I think. You need yeah. to push past the barriers and you've got to ask for stuff. And I know the traveller community, like I said, they're tough people, very respectful, family orientated, but super, super confident. And that's kind of what drew me towards boxing and also, you know, speaking to a lot of travellers and boxing with them and stuff and also your dad. Hmm. Um, like I say, as 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 for travellers, it, it's difficult for me to explain, but they've always, like, the boxers that, you know heavyweight champion of the world Tyson Fury you know he wasn't allowed in the Olympics you know because of his because he was a traveller but like, I, 
I don't say I find it hard to believe, but you know, Billy Joe did get in the Olympics and yeah. he's also a traveller, but it is a fact that Tyson did not get in the Olympics because he was a traveller or this is what gets said. So maybe it might not be a fact, but I'm I believe it. Yeah. So in any case, we've always got knocked back, right? For nothing, really. You know, because of uh the stigma what's attached to us, you know, people that think travellers, you know, thieves, you know, pull up on your drive with caravans, you know, all this crack out, doing whatever they do. But they don't see past that. Mm. Can you see where I'm coming from? Of they, they, they think because, let's say somebody goes and knocks on someone's door, because a lot of travellers, not so much anymore, but, you know, they, they knock on somebody's door. They offer a service, right? But they have the door shut in their face and... They are offering a genuine service, yeah. probably for half the price of the next person that's going to come along. But somebody would rather give the work to somebody else just because they haven't knocked on their door. That work could genuinely need doing yeah. and be done cheaper by a traveller. I've got to be honest with you. I don't know if it was travellers, but I assume just because of the confidence again, yes. I had some building work, I had my whole house refurbed and it bloody went on for about a year. Yeah, I was, it was meant to be a three month project which was only going to cost me 50 grand, four times the amount of money and a year later I was still bloody doing work to it because once you do one thing you have to start another and it Absolutely. was just it was just a bloody headache. Anyway, group group of fellas turned up at my door and I thought it was the builder so I answered the door and he said, oh, you got all the rubbish out there, do you want me to take it away? And I was like, Fucking, yeah, great, great service, you know, because I was thinking I have to pay all this money to get a skip and everything else, and they just took it all. Mm. And that's the point, like, they're go-getters. They don't wait for things to happen. They go and find the opportunity, you know, and that's what I admire about them. And they get criticised for that, Mm. you know? Like, can you blame blame somebody? You know, like, let's say a a phone call, for example, like, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of telesales people out there, but actual people, I'm not talking about these robots, but telesales, people answer the phone and, you know, five out of 10, we'll carry on with the conversation to see what happens. It's only maybe one out of 50 that will actually carry on the conversation at the door. Yeah. 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 It's tough. It's just, it's just, it's a tough thing to get into. Um, so, uh, so yeah, talking about your, your dad then. So your dad's, Actually, you just reminded me of something because he actually said to me, I think on the on the interview that he, I think at the first stages of being a business person, he kind of artfully didn't mention he was a traveller. I think mm-hmm. that's what he said to me because he felt like it was going to hold him back. And then after I, after time, when he was you know well established, he was like, "Well, fuck it, I'll just tell everyone who I, who I am." And now he really kind of endorses it, and he's kind of embraces it which I think you need to do but I understand why he was a little bit tentative towards it because just like racism or just like stereotypes or just like judgment it's quite easy to sometimes be put in a box over here and say oh they're that type of person that's like their type of person but when you try to to hide something like that that let's say if you're you're a traveler or a gypsy for example when you try and hide something like that which to be fair is is relatively easy for for myself to do i could cover it up quite well not now obviously but back in the day you know i could cover it up quite well there's no clear marks that i am a traveler you know Mm. and the stigma that's attached to us doesn't really help Mm. you know like you know there's there's 50 percent of the population it was a lot worse like i'm talking in the last 10 years and still is quite bad you know i wouldn't do that with him because he's a traveler Mm. simple as that no other reasons what's he ever done to you well, nothing. nothing. Yeah. He's a traveller. Yeah. He's got cousins that have done this. I don't know, but I'm sure they have. He must have done something <laughs> wrong in his life. Yeah. You know, there's good and bad in all people. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, if you don't, if you don't, like, if you don't let everybody know that you're a traveller with something like that, it will then get used against you. But you know, like if you say, "Yeah, I'm a traveller," so what? Then what do they do? Yeah. There's, they've got you. You're a traveller. So what? It yeah. is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, can, it it could get used against you. And I'm sure my dad then soon realised that, yeah, this this could get used against me. What, what have I done wrong? Yeah. I'm a legitimate businessman. I've never done nothing wrong in my whole life. Yeah. Why should I hide that I'm a traveller? Yeah. Yeah, you know, what, right. to, to, to To please everybody else. Yeah. You know, he's come to a stage where people have to do business with him. Yeah. They come to him to do business. Yeah. You know? So yeah. it doesn't matter whether he's a traveller or whether he's green. Yeah. You know? They come to him to do business. Yeah, yeah. So the tables have turned, and now now we understand. And to be fair, the likes of Tyson Fury, the likes of my dad, the likes of these uh, 
let's say travellers in the public eye, are actually doing a very good job for us. Yeah. You know, because what people don't understand, there is good and bad in all people. I wouldn't vouch for every traveller. I wouldn't. Yeah. But I would vouch for at least 50% they're all good, but the thing is 50% of white people are bad. Of course. You know? Yeah. So, I, listen, it's just it's just a difficult one for people. Like, when people understand us and some people know us, you know, like, if you used to speak to someone and them say, oh, yeah, I know a travelling kid. Oh, he's a real nice kid, this, that, the other. And someone that doesn't know a traveller, they'd be like, well, I don't believe he can't be a traveller. <laughs> what, he <laughs> hasn't robbed nobody? He's not a traveller. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, so, uh, you, you, your father then. So, this is a question I ask, like, um, to anyone who's had, like, a six, six successful family or even a successful uh, father or mother who was an athlete. Mm-hmm. So, I've interviewed a few boxers or a few footballers that have had dads who are professionals. Mm-hmm. Do you find it, like... Because I come from what I would call relatively normal background. My mum and my dad weren't broke mm-hmm. and they weren't rich. It was just kind of normal, Yeah. My, my version of normal. Um, having someone like your dad who's uber successful and uber driven and uber like, you know, just focused, do you think can that, can that give you a bit more pressure in a, in, a, in a bad way or does it give you so much, so much pressure that it gives you inspiration? That's a hard question, to be fair, because, and the reason being is because, yes, there's immense pressure on me, but only because I want to do better. Not for any other reason. You know, I actually want to do better than him. It is a competition. Not that I'd want to see him fail for me to do better. Absolutely not. I'd want to see him strive, make his business the best there is, as big as Virgin, let's say. You know, I'd, I'd want to see him do that. And I want to go again and be better. Like I, To be fair, I'm further forward than my dad was when he was my age. But I've had a lot of opportunities arise for me because of who my dad is. Mm. You know, a lot of doors have opened because I'm Alfie Best Jr., you know, and there was a couple of years I went through, I don't like this, you know, I want to be my own man, I don't want people to do things for me because of who my dad is. And then after a certain amount of time, I thought, I'll embrace this, you know, why don't I just let it let it work for me? You know, it is what it is, my dad is who he is. You know, I do want to do better than him. Fortunately for me, these doors are open, you know, but before I was like, you know, I was saying about people didn't want to do business with people because there was travellers. I wouldn't want to do business with someone because they was doing it for me because my dad. I was going to, I was going to bring this up actually, because not that I had this thought about before the, the interview, but the paradox is now I don't want to do business with them because they're travellers. Oh, he's got so powerful now. I have to do business with him, but I don't want to do business with his son because, you know, he's only doing it because of his old man. And it's, it's mad because whether you've got, loads of money or you're broke or you're this or you're that there's challenges in both mm-hmm. it, you know you're damned if you do and you're damned, damned if you don't sometimes so do you ever get that do you ever get people trying to criticize you on social media and stuff because you know your old man your dad you know is such a success and 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 sometimes it's hard to make your own kind of noise all the time every every day you know i get called a daddy's boy you wouldn't be nowhere without your dad and i will sit here and i will say you know i hold my hands up Possibly, I might not be where I am today without my dad. You know, but unfortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, I'd say, I can't change that. You know, he is who he is and he's done great things for me. He's never actually put his hand in his pocket and gone, there you go. He's gone, do this, this and this, and this will work. Like, yeah. he's, he's, he's given me opportunities, but if I never grabbed them opportunities and made them work, they would have been nothing. Yeah. They would have been my words I'm saying to you now. Literally nothing. You know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, but yeah, it, it it's difficult, you know. But it's it's not because you know there's a lot of jealous people out there and things like that. And as long as people are talking about you, you're making some sort of noise, you know. Yeah. To a certain extent. But the thing is, like Alf, like yourself, me, got Maria here. We've got like people we work with. Well, without our mum and dads, none of us would have been where we are today. You know, whether we're uber successful or just on our way to being a success. You know. So it is right. If you didn't have a mum or dad, you wouldn't be where you are today. It just so happens that the levels are slightly different. Mm-hmm. But we've all got the same opportunity. Going back to your dad, his words were to me on that interview, I was born on the side of the road and now I've amassed Wild, uh, Wildcrest Park Homes, which is the biggest in Europe. At the time when I interviewed him, this is my memory now, two years ago he had four sites in America. Mm-hmm. I know he was expanding. Bahamas, 
Was it? Barbados. Barbados. He had like a few places over there, but that wasn't um, park homes. That was like luxury. Villas, yeah. That's it. Uh, and no doubt it's been, you know, he's probably amplified ever, ever, ever since then. So if he can do it, you know, it surely shows that the blueprint is there for other people to do it, regardless of your background and who you are. Absolutely. And to be fair, like, he he himself, like, <clears throat> I'd like to say me myself is a perfect example, which technically I would be, but the thing is, he is he's the mould, if you like, you know what I mean? He's, he was the first, you know, like I'd like to say, you know, I'd be the role model, etc. But that's not the case because he, hold on a second, he, just remind me, what was we talking about then? Um, he's like the blueprint of success. Yes, absolutely. He's not academic, academically clever. And yeah. neither am I. I mean, we've got neither no grades. We've got zero. Like, not a thing. I learned to read and write through social media. If Facebook never existed, I would not be able to read. Yeah. Like I literally, like, in school, it's not that my... My attention's unbelievable if I like something, if I'm interested. Yeah. If I'm not interested... Switch off. That's it. I, you could sit and talk to me, and if I'm not interested... I, I'd, Sa- same here. ADHD I've got. Yeah, you know, I just I just switch off. I can't... Yeah. I, I, but if I'm interested in something, like history, I used to love history. I used to get top grades. Yeah. You know? But I couldn't read and write, but I used yeah. to love history. Yeah. For some unknown reason. And my, da- my dad's exactly the same. No, yeah. he's, he's spelling's terrible. That's how I said. My, you know, my dad he's, as well. his spelling's actually terrible. But it's, it's it's just one of them things, you know. If he can do it, literally anybody can do it. Yeah. And the same as myself, like, you know, I can't necessarily say that because people say, right, well, your dad's already walked that road. Hmm. You know? Yeah. Like, okay, he has. But the thing is, what I have branched off and I've done my own thing. Like I say, I've got... Uh, I buy and sell luxury watches. Um, I used to have a motocross track in Hertfordshire. I've d- I've done most jobs, to be fair, um, but I've I've stuck at the watches, and I, I've got two mobile home parks of my own. Cool, they're called Best Park best, Homes. Best Park Homes. Yeah. Are you going to expand them? Um, abs- ah, one hundred and fifty percent. I'm trying to expand it as a business. Like the reason I'm called Best is because it's my name, and my dad didn't call it Best because obviously of the traveller stigma thing. Okay. But now, obviously, we've branched off and we're, we, we're, we're letting everybody know we don't care that we're travellers. We're happy about it, you know? As a matter of fact... Isn't it, it better? D- it's that actually becoming a bit of a trend. Yeah. People that ain't travellers are now saying they're travellers. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah. happening, you yeah. know? Yeah. And it, and also, if they're ever go- if anyone's ever going to buy one of the, the park homes off you, or, or, off you and your, your father, well, surely, isn't it better to buy... From a community that understands the trailer park or the the static park home business, doesn't it make more sense of doing that? See, if I started that business, they'll be like, "Who are you? You don't know anything about that." But your your family, your bloodline, know everything to do with with that type of business. One hundred percent. But you can look at anything like a, like let's say Heinz tomato sauce, for example. Yeah. You know, if there's two bottles of tomato sauce there, regardless to the price, you know, yeah. like. 90% of people are going to pick up Heinz yeah. over, let's say, some brand that's just come out. Yeah. Regardless to how good the recipe is. Yeah. You know? Like brand affiliation. People are going to go with what they know. Yeah. yeah. What they've seen. Yeah. And I would do the exact same myself, and I can't blame I can't blame people yeah. for that. So your, your business is then, because this is what I was going to get, mm-hmm. get to, best kettles? Yeah. Best uh, park homes? Best park homes. Um, and anything else? Best motor parks, but we got closed down. Yeah, okay. during quarantine. <clears throat> okay, but I am relaunching. For, I'm, I'm looking for somewhere else to put a motocross track. To be quite honest with you, again, the government over here they're, they're, they're all upside down because you know they've got kids and everything ripping up and down on roads, but they're making life so difficult to pass motocross tracks or to get to get a law. It's, it's actually a very grey area. I don't actually know a, a lot about it at all. But you know, again, like we were saying about getting kids off the street, like. It's illegal to be riding around on motocross bikes. You know, to go to a park on a motocross bike or anything, you'll have your bike took off you. You know, it's, it's not allowed. You'll mm. never see it. But, again, they're not letting people open tracks. Or they are. There's very far and they're very few between. You know, they're, they're not about. Yeah. But then they're wondering why it's so crazy, street crime, like you say, etc. You know, the government do not think of this. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, because, right, you know, let's just say there was a motocross track, let's just say, in the middle of London. There wouldn't be because it's not, you know, it's too city. But let's just say there was one in the middle of London. 
and there was a kid that got stabbed, let's say, during the day. Well, do people not think, well, maybe if there was a motocross track or a skate park, him or him could have been at the skate park and not in that position. Yeah. You know, like I say, the devil makes work for idle hands, you know, yeah. idle hands. Yeah. As long as you're doing something, whether that's boxing, training, riding a motorcycle, whatever you're doing, your hands are not idle. Yeah. You're doing something. Your brain is occupied. You know, like a lot of these stabbings and things like that, <laughs> I'd imagine are grudges. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I'm sure it, it some happens a spare at the moment, etc. But a lot of them are grudges. And they're sat there, their minds working overtime like it happens before it even happens. Yeah, they visualize it. Almost. You know, like right, they're working themselves up. Like like you say, to go to a boxing gym, you could go to the boxing gym, let the steam off, bang, you forgot about that then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you come out of a boxing gym so much clearer headed. Of course. And the same as the same as riding a motocross bike. Yeah, well, like you said, like um, I, I also think that the the whole gang mentality stuff, and also uh, the stabbings, and what, even the violence, I think it comes down to also a sense of belonging. Mm. Like I'm not agreeing with people that go and join a gang for wrong things and and end up robbing or shooting or stabbing someone. That's that's obviously bang out of order and co completely wrong and illegal. But I do understand partly that it's a sense of a kid who might not have had the best upbringing or togetherness in the family, and now they've got a togetherness in this gang. But that's what a boxing club can do for you. But Absolutely. they're not exposed to it because there's this, there's this um, misconception that it's violent. And, and, and it's not. It's, it's challenging any aggression that you've got or any kind of rage or any kind of anger or any kind of anything into a art that you can transfer that mindset into other sectors and it actually makes you a better person. 100%, I couldn't agree with you more. And my boxing trainers, I'd say 90% of them, like my dad was a, uh, was my coach for a little while and then I moved to a boxing club in Slough. But most of my boxing trainers, I can genuinely say, like, you know, you're talking about family figures, I developed a love for them. Like, mm. I actually love them. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, they was actually like a part of my family. Yeah. Like, genuinely. Yeah. And a lot of boys I've boxed with, like some of them I don't speak to for years, but I can sit and talk to them like they're my best friends and I've spoke to them every day. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, not many people I can do that with, but people that I was in a boxing gym with, or even kids from other clubs. Yeah. You know, like I remember you from the schools that time. Kids that I've boxed. Yeah. You know, kids that I've actually boxed, like that, that maybe you think there is a bit of hostility yeah. Held towards them. Kids that I've actually boxed are like, yeah. you know, I've spoke to them afterwards. Oh, how are you? What are yeah. you doing? You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, I'm married now, etc., yeah. etc. Et like that, you say that level of respect. I don't think you'll find it anywhere else. No, it's good, good common ground. So, um, with yourself then, with the businesses and stuff, I know you were featured on Ascot. Uh, yes. Absolute, absolute, absolutely, Ascot. Yeah. yeah. How, the, how, how was that for you? I mean, how come you end up doing um, that? Was that, was that more of a, not a PR, but a, a profile building exercise is that why you, why you done it or was it just for the crack of it um i didn't want to do it actually and then i ended up going out with a girl who um basically wanted to do it etc etc and I, I, whilst i was going out of her i said no i don't want to do it and then i said okay that was getting talked around i'll do it i won't do it i, I did I, I didn't want to do it you know i actually st i didn't start it but i was the first person that the producer come to and said, right, I've got this. And at the time, before I thought it all through, I thought, yeah, I'll do it. No problem. What a brilliant thing. Like, I love that. I'm profile building, do you know what I mean? I mm. thought, great, lovely, you know? And then after that, I sat down and thought about it. And, you know, I'm a deep thinker. Like, any, any, but listen, if you're in business, you understand, you need to think things through, you know? You my, do, yeah. my, my dad's brilliant at, not saying not thinking things through, but taking calculated chances which I'm not too good at you know I, I don't like taking any chances whether they're calculated or not and you know most of them pay off but I didn't thought to myself you know I could go on here I could say something I could make myself look like an idiot like like the diverse effect is worse than the positive yeah. you know so I ended up saying no I don't really want to do it and then the girlfriend that I was going out with at the time just went and done the filming like, I, I'm on my way to do the filming. Like, so now I'd like, I, I, I didn't know what to do. Do you know what I mean? So I thought, and I did say, yeah, I'd do it, but no, I don't want to do it, etc. But I, I didn't want to do it. 
regardless. Then she went and done it, and I thought, right, well, I've got to go on her with her now because obviously we was in a relationship, and I don't regret it at all. To be fair, I wish it would have done a little bit better. Um, Is there any more coming up? I don't think so, as far as I'm aware, no. Okay. Um, but yeah, I wish it would have done a little bit better, and you know, it, it was fun while it was on, but you know, this um, this 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 reality TV, I think when when Towie done it, it, it took off. You know, now I think it's it's dying out, and people are not that interested. You yeah. know, like there's been, like you know, everything after Towie reality in my eyes is now a copy. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it, it's not the same, and I'm I'm talking honestly. Um, but yeah, I, I I didn't really want to do it, you know. And to be fair, I I love building my profile. I think it's great in the position that I'm in now. It helps me, helps mm. me do everything, and I'm I'm sure anybody that's in business having a a good high profile helps definitely definitely well is the answer to your to your question earlier about my podcast and where i want to take it and i'm I'm always open with people that listen in the future i would love to monetize it because i think not that you necessarily need the money but when you monetize something it shows that you're doing something well and you're getting rewarded for it so why not when i look at joe rogan and someone like that i'm a complete baby in comparison to, to him but why couldn't I take that centre stage at some point? If I hard, if I commit to it, then, then why not? But the point is, this is used as a profile building exercise for me and also Woodbury House, the company. And we've had a lot of good business off the back end of it. And even if we don't have business, I connect with people that I can never connect to. I mean, because I've got a podcast, I've got to meet you. I've got to have a good, honest chat with you. Your dads, footballers, boxers, other entrepreneurs, artists. I mean, it's been fa- fantastic. And I think going on to TV or reality stuff. Um, I think if it's done in the right way, it can be very, very good. Um, I look at two people. There's to- Tommy Mallet from Only a- a- Ways Essex. I think he's massive, done a- massive inspiration of mine. Oh, big. I mean, he just talks so real. He seems very down to earth. I met him a few times in Dubai through a, a f- friends of mine. Um, he's obviously got his Mallet's shoes and stuff, and I think he's doing f- a fantastic job. And I would say definitely it's down to his hustle, hard work and everything else and his product, but then also, because he has a profile from, from Towie, and there's someone else I'm in talks with at the moment who hopefully potentially will come on the podcast, is Jake Hall, who's also doing good things with his clothing brand called Preview. He was also on Towie. So I think if you use it in the right way, be on there, but then pivot or dovetail into a business, can really, really be quite lucrative for you. Well, it, it, it's, we never got paid for uh, Absolutely Ascot, and I'm quite sure that, that no reality TV pays, and if they yeah. do, it, 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 it's Peanuts. very, very minimal. Yeah. And Tommy Malley, I've, I've got to say, no disrespect to anybody else on Towie, but he is the only one in my eyes that has actually gone off and made Towie work for him. Yeah. Made it work for him. You know, all of them's got loads of followers, and, and, and luckily, Instagram also pays, you know, for advertising, etc. I've, I've experienced it firsthand. You know, some people pay me for advertisements. You know, I'm yeah. person, I know it's near as big as any of them, but I know it pays. You can earn money from it, but, you know, they can all do that. Tommy can still do that. Yeah. And he's got his trainer brand, yeah. which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, like, you know, I see it in Harrods and I think to myself, <coughs> like, wow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, like, this kid's from the road. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's inspiration. No, he's, like, come on, he's he's gone there. Like, he's, his vision is amazing. Yeah. Like, where he's took it, you yeah. know, because, like, like I say, not many people, like, I mean, even the bestest of footballers, for example, you know, once their, once their run is over, it's over, that's it. They haven't got nothing left. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, with this reality TV, there's a wave, you know, and I think, He's done the best thing. You ride that wave because eventually it is going to finish. It's going to collapse. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think oh, it's just amazing. It is uh, to be yeah. fair. Like, so do you know, like doing doing the reality TV stuff, yes. and obviously having your father and being a, a boxer and, mm-hmm. and and doing loads of loads of different things is obviously giving you a good social presence. You know, um, I can't actually remember the number, but you're in tens of thousands of followers on Instagram. Ninety odd. Is it thousand or just six? under ninety thousand? Yeah, and then you're 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 approved. You know yes. the blue chip, blue tick. Um, I don't know how old you. Are. I'm thirty five. How old are you? Twenty three. Twenty three. Okay, so I had um, Melvin uh, Odoom, if I pronounce that right. He's Radio One presenter. He was on here yesterday, and he's forty years of age. And I said to him, I said, "Me and you, as in Melvin, we're in the same category, as in 
we're now in our professional working life and I remember life as almost a young teenager coming into my adulthood where there was no social media. You know, there was internet, but no real social media. And now I'm in business, I'm very much living in the life of social media. It's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because I can connect with people. It's a blessing because I can sell my product, I can sell my service. The curse, it can be a big distraction. It could be hate, it could be insults, it could be, you know, it could lead on to bad things. And I wanted to ask you, because you're, because you're, you know, I would say a lot younger than me, um, social media, uh, how do you feel about it? Is it like a blessing for you? Is it a bit of a hindrance? How, how, what's your take on it? I, lo- I love social media. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant tool. If used in the right way, I think it's... Um, the, the way I see it is Instagram for me is a shop front for myself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. People want, uh, like, you know, say they want to do business, etc. You can look through, oh, right, this kid likes motorbikes. This kid likes boxing. You know, this kid likes his cars. It's it's a shop window for anybody in the world to connect. That's what I love about it. You know, social media, one person could be in Dubai, we could be here, we're watching his Instagram stories. We feel like we're there. We know what's going on. It connects the world so nicely. But I do think it is overtaking the world, mm. like, extremely. You know, like, to me, I'm, I'm extremely guilty that I'm always on social media. Like, my, my life actually evolves around it to a certain extent like b- both of my businesses are mainly run on social media my motocross track and my watches yeah. you know, like I say I do I do have a website but if anybody calls up or any inquiries I get 99% have come via Instagram yeah you know and I think it's a brilliant work tool if used in the right way but it could also be a very 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 bad I don't know the word I'm looking for like, like, it could work out very bad. You know, if you're not posting the right stuff, if you're not doing the right thing, then people are going to dislike you. And that's mm. not what you want. Of course, there's people out there that dislike you anyway. But Regardless, you can, yeah. You know, it is what it is. You can you can see, like... Have you had to, like, block people? Because they never. Was, yeah. I would never block anybody, you know, from from someone with... 20 followers to someone that's got 5 billion followers. Yeah. You never do that. You know, I, yeah. d- I don't see the point why. Yeah. You know, my Instagram's there. You you feel free to comment on whatever you want. It doesn't bother me. Like, I'm hard-skinned. I don't get offended by things like that. I know what yeah. I've done. Yeah. I know where I've been. Yeah. I know what I've gone through. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't need somebody that I've never met to try and tell me. Do you know, like, speaking to you as well, it's quite refreshing. I'm not knocking any, you know, younger person that I've been around. Uh, of course not, because everyone's built differently. But, again, go into this traveller, boxing, business person, you come across really resilient, which I love, you know, because I do think we're in an age now, like, when I was younger, like, <laughs> I saw a quote the other day, and it was really funny. It said something along the lines of, I once died when I was five years of age and my mum told me to walk it off. It was basically say, saying when, he, when they were younger that whatever happened to you, your mum was like, crack on, get, get on with it, stop crying. And some people may say, well, that was covering up mental health issues and everything else. Mm-hmm. But in actual fact, sometimes that is the best remedy to say, just fucking crack on. And I'm quite tough with my son, even though he's two and a bit years of age. I boisterous with him and stuff because I want to make him tough, you know, because well, the world can be a tough place. And... I'm a little bit fearful because, like I said, I've entered social media and I'm a bit like you. Whatever you fright me, that ain't going to bother me. I'm just going to crack on. But I know a lot of people are not built like that, especially in the social media world. You know, I get really offended quite quickly. You're in a snowflake kind of era where that you say one thing, it offends someone. Um, and, it, and, and it's now you can't say this, you can't do that, you can't do that. And I'm trying to teach my son, even at a young age, that, you know what, whatever someone says about you, however the world responds to you, you just come back harder. Uh, that's how you got to be, and I got, kind of get that impression from you as well. So your your dad and your culture must have been instilled into you. Do you know, I, I actually believe it's a mindset, you know, yeah. and I'm sure I inherit that from my dad, um, because my mum's quite soft, you know. I'm sure if my mum was on social media, I don't I don't think she could handle. Like my dad, actually, to be quite honest with you, he, he handles things all wrong. Like you know, on messages and things like that, he responds to these haters. You know, he mm. actually he actually gets tied up sometimes. Yeah. You know, trying to, you know, trying to prove himself. You know, and I'm like, Dad, 
like, you're a very extremely clever man and you let yourself down there, you know? I mean, oh, I just want to tell them that this ain't right, blah de blah de blah this, that, the other, you know? And I'm like, you know, Dad, like, sometimes you just got to let that slide. Like, if you, like, you're, you're in the public eye now, you know? You can't respond to everybody. You can't please everybody. You know, it's, it's impossible, and that's the way I see it. And anybody that cannot handle, uh, you know, any abuse or any, any trolling on Twitter... Uh, on Instagram or any social media, my solid advice would be come off of it. Because the thing is, you are, are bait for people. Or put your account on private and just have your friends on there. You know, obviously Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is, is not for you. Yeah. Because there is always going to be someone <clears throat> like... In school, there was always someone that said something, you know, you'd have your group of friends or whatever. There'd always be some clever little kid or something, you know... Always have something to say. You know, you could come in with a new pair of shoes or something, you know. Oh, they're, they're gay, for example. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you used to get that in school. And, that, you know, that school is, again, you know, you come out of school and then you come into the real world. The real world is like a great big school. It is. It is actually like, you know, you get the bullies of the playground. You get the, the, the idiots that are not going nowhere, not doing anything. Trolling on Twitter, that's what they do. My... my my answer to them is like, what? Well, what better have they got to do? Yeah, you know, I'm always positive to everybody on Instagram and Twitter. I think you know, it costs nothing, and could go so very far. Yeah, you know, one comment of someone, right? Somebody could start up a business. My one comment of, oh my god, that's great. I hope you do so well. Could be like, oh my god, young Alfie Best has just approved my business. I <laughs> cannot believe it. I'm soldiering on, I'm going to make this... That one positive comment, but one negative comment can work completely in reverse. Of course it can. You know, instead of, oh, I'm going to do this, oh, what a terrible life, why did I even think of doing that? What a fool I am, you know? And I, I do believe in this mental health thing, I do. Hmm. But since it's since it's been publicised even more than it has, because I don't know, I was only a kid like 10, 15 years ago, but... You never really used to hear about mental health. No, not like at all. Growing up, I never used to hear about it. Let's say when I was a kid or maybe I was too young to be looking, uh, listening to these radio debates. But like I say, as a kid, I never used to hear of it. But now it's coming about. Again, it's becoming a trend. Like I'm hearing more about it. Oh, it, it, me even. My anxiety. Can't do it because of my anxiety, which is all down to mental health. Exactly. But I've never had mental health or anxiety in my whole life. When I used to box, I used to get nervous, but I'd never put that down as anxiety. Mm. I'd never say, oh, I was anxious. I'd say, oh, I've got butterflies, I've got butterflies. That was it. Mm. But now everyone, oh, this anxiety thing, this mental health thing. Like, listen, like I say, it's out there. Yeah. Just believe me, and it affects a lot of people. Well, do you know what? It, it, it sounds like a, if someone just entered this conversation now, it sounds very, very similar to, and this could be quite a controversial conversation, but the COVID thing, it's like COVID's out there. I get that. I do get it's out there and I do know it has wiped out a few people, same as mental health. I know it's out there. I know it affects a few people. But because it's been publicised so much, people are latching onto it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't do that because of COVID. Oh, I can't do that because of this. And I think sometimes if things weren't publicised as much, it's a catch-22. Their argument is, well, if you don't publicise it, people are not aware of it and people can't treat it and everything else. But at the same time, if you over-publicise it, then people start tricking themselves into thinking, oh, this is the route I should go down, or this is what this is my excuse, or this is what I can leverage. It's a hard one because, you know, you voice these sort of conversations with certain people. Thankfully, I can have an honest conversation with you. If I have a, someone else, they get slammed down to the floor. You can't say that, you can't say that, you can't say that. I think the the the, the COVID thing is a similar, similar sort of conversation, you know. I personally think this is my take. We know the, the data. We know that people are vulnerable or old or got under our line, line of health is issues. Maybe they should stay in. It's their choice. But everybody else, let's just crack on. You know, if I get COVID, it's probably most likely that I'm going to get through it. I know plenty of my friends have had it. They had no symptoms. That doesn't sound like a killer virus to me, that you have to test to see if you've got this killer virus. Or if they have had it, they're wiped up for three or four days, you know. That's just my take on it. I'm not saying it's the right one. I'm just saying that's that's my take. I think if they carry on with what they're doing, they're going to ruin so many more lives because of the 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 so-called you know treatment of it all. Don't know if you got a view on it. I 150. I, I I couldn't agree with you more. To be honest, and again, my, we, we, 
we just share the same opinion. I don't know if that's right. We both could be wrong, but that's my opinion. That's my take on it. That's what I believe. You know, I'd, I, I, my heart bleeds for anybody that's lost anybody to COVID. You know, my heart goes out to everybody and all their families. But you know, we've tried now. You know, we've put the country on lockdown. It, if it hasn't worked the first time, I get that there's other waves coming, etc. But you know, we can't. We can't stop life to save every life. What's the point of living? Mm. You know, like, okay, like I'm not the Prime Minister and I'm sure Boris Johnson's got a very, 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 very difficult job. But from an outsider's point of view, him nor Matt Hancock know what they're talking about. No. Like, hold on, there's other countries like China that have got over it. You know, I don't believe this conspiracy of this new world order and everything else, you know, I don't believe that. I, d I do believe they are trying to do the best for the country. You know, I, again, I might be wrong. There might be a big hidden agenda behind it. I don't know. But I do believe they're trying to do the best for the country. But, you know, he's, he's had something. I, feel, I, I actually feel sorry for him because who knows how to deal with this? Mm. You know, everybody's going to be so quick to chuck up answers. Oh, should have done this, should have done that. And it's so difficult. But my answer is, you know, We've been in lockdown. We've done one lockdown. We've done two. We're in our third. Yeah. You know, it's basically ruined the whole of the Christmas. This would have, like, discreetly ruined 50% of boxers that was coming through. Yeah. You yeah. know, because all it takes is to have two weeks off of training and realise how nice this is to sit at home before you fall in the habit of doing nothing. You're in the habit of going training. You love going training. You can't wait to go. You sit on the armchair watching the telly for f two or three weeks. Oh, I don't want to go, but I'll start next week. Yeah. I'll start next week. You know, at least give them their opportunities. Yeah. For the boxers, the footballers, the, you know, the kids that have worked however long, the kids, adults, whatever they're going to do, you know, that's some people's lives at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, I get close the shops, close the nightclubs if, the, if that's what makes you feel better. Yeah, but that would it's um, it, it's actually ruining people's lives yeah like I, people don't look as in depth into it as me but it's a fact yeah and um, also Alfie I think you might share the same thing we were just like on the conversation of mental health then we've just gone round to the, the COVID but going back round to mental health surely this lockdown is fucking up people's mental health because I walk down the street sometimes a year ago you know you walk down the street as normal Someone walks past you. You might even say, have a little wave to them or say hello. Now, people are diving across the pavement because they might be a little bit older than you. You haven't got a mask on because you're outside. They are extra cautious or paranoid. They've got a mask on, they've got a Pfizer on, and they're darting across the road. And I'm thinking, you're probably going to still act like that when you, um, when you come out of lockdown. I'll give you a prime example. I've got a client of mine, and he, he, you know, he's an he's a investor. He flips art. And uh, I spoke to him. I said, oh, you must be right happy that, you know, coming out of lockdown, it's slowly but surely unlocking. He went, well, no. Nah. And I said, well, haven't you had your COVID jab? And he went, yeah, I've had the first one. I said, well, when you get the second one? And he said, well, no, 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 I probably won't come, come out of my house. And I, and I said, what? He said, I haven't been out my, I haven't had a haircut in 18 months. He said, if you look at me, I look like a homeless person. And I, I, said, I wanted to be sensitive because he's older. And I said, just... Don't let this whole thing control your mental outlook on life. And I think, unfortunately, the media have done that to people. You know, think about those people. Because even when we get out of this thing, there are going to be many people trapped in their own mind. You know, they're not going to go and see their family. They're not going to go and see their friends. He's, I said, oh, you, he said, no, tell a lie. I wasn't in my house all the time. I've been in my garden. Or sometimes when I go out the house, I drive around the countryside. I say, oh, you get out to the fields, oh, yeah? And he was like, no, stay in my car. He's like, yeah. It's like the whole the whole media has has made him feel that if he gets out the car and touches someone, goes near them, he's going to contract something. Yeah, well, I've got to say fair play to him because the reason I say that, I'm not saying what he's doing is right, but he's doing him. Yeah. He's not right worrying about what everybody else is doing or I'm staying out because there's these rule breakers that ain't, he's doing him right. This is the way he sees it. That's not, I'd, I'd, I'd beg and plead with him. I'd say, please come out. There's nothing to hide from. There really isn't. You know, this big killer virus, yes, 
okay, it's killing people. I understand that. But the thing is, there's many other ways we can die. You know? And sitting in your home, just rotting away, is, is, is not one of them. Do you know what I mean? Listen, mm. you know, like I say, what's, what's the point in living? To, to, to live locked up away. Yeah. Like, this is a glorified prison sentence, really. It is. To, to, to people that have never done a thing wrong in their life. Like, I, and, and they're wondering why crime's gone. Yeah. People are not earning money. People can't eat, you know? And they think, oh, because we're giving government bounce-back loans. I'm not being funny or nothing. Probably 50% of them government bounce-back loans have ended up in the wrong hands. Yeah, of course they have. You know? Like, the, what, what are they thinking through? All genuine taxpayers' money. Like, they want to rob you blind of taxpayers' money and then give it away. Like, I, I don't, I just don't understand that. Mm. You know, mm. I, I can't get my head around. Like, they're the things that I think to myself, like, have they actually sat down and thought about this? Because surely anybody in their right mind would think this through. Yeah. Like, how much would it cost to have somebody to go and visit these people with the bounce back loans? Yeah. A lot less than what they <clears throat> would have lost for illegitimate people taking that money. Yeah. And you, do you know what? I wouldn't do it, but I can't say I blame them. Yeah. If it's that easy to go and collect £50,000 in fair play, do it. And I'm quite sure it's that easy. Yeah. Well, I've known plenty of people that have done it. And the thing is, in life as an entrepreneur, you're taught to take your opportunities. And if you can do it in a, you know, a legal or a great area scenario, why wouldn't they do it? You know? Absolutely. Um, there's a couple more things I want to ask you, but I've got to say so far, I've been really enjoying this conversation with you, mate, and you're everything that I thought you were going to be. You're right down to earth, really likeable likeable guy and very relatable. Um, I had a guy on my podcast called Terry Stone. I know Terry. Yeah. I know Terry very well. Because I didn't realise, I watched one of his films, and then I think you and, was your dad in it as well? No, just just you. Yeah, yeah. you. You played a ca- cameo role, yes, is that right? Absolutely. In uh, Once Upon a Time Once in London? Once Upon a Time in London. Yeah, right. really, really cool film that was. So, um. More acting for you in the future? More films? Um, like, I'd love to go to acting school and I'd love to take up acting because, again, only because what I'm seeing from the outside of acting, you know, like, it all looks, you know, pretty good to me. Yeah. You know, the money's there, you know, great profile building. But that was an opportunity that come up and I don't know if that opportunity would ever come up again and I'm not willing to put myself through acting school and all that time and effort on the chance that I could potentially do something, you know. I know for a fact if I get my head down and work hard day in, day out, I will be successful. There's no doubt about it. You know, I look at that's my destiny. It's, it, it, that's it. Anybody. Yes, yeah, written you know, in I the stars. I don't care if you get up and you're sweeping roads every single day. Eventually, you're going to move up the chain. As long as you're dedicated and you, you like what you do, it's inevitable. Yeah. You know, it's not just going to fall on your lap. You know, it, it it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I'd, I'd I'd love to go to acting school. I would do more acting if the opportunity come up, but I wouldn't be putting myself out of my way. My acting skills, I believe, are unbelievable. You know, I'm very confident. You know, Terry someone, said, he said you were very, very good. If, if he said, uh, like, listen, I've never done any acting school, done nothing, you know, um, I'm a good salesman, which is a brilliant way to start acting. I was going to say this. I think Tom Cruise was the famous person who said, if you want a good actor, get a good salesperson, because yeah. it is about adapting, isn't it? Absolutely. And to Going into different roles. With you, I'm, I'm actually very good. I was actually quite good as a boxer for that reason, because I was good at adapting to the boxer I was in front of. You know, which that's what boxing's all about. You know, styles make fights. But I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be going to acting school, and I think that's the people that they are looking for. I don't think they're just looking for someone with a, a, a relatively good profile. It's because I know Terry personally yeah. that I managed to get that role. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was over the moon. Do you know what? It was one of the best couple of days I ever had. It was unbelievable. It was an experience I'd never, ever, ever forget. I don't care if I never, ever do it again. I'd love to. Don't get me wrong, but that was enough. Mm. You know what I mean? To see how it all goes on. Terry's unbelievable. The, yeah, the people I was working with as well. And, you know, to look backstage and to see what goes into them films. Like... It, it it is massive, you know. Mm. Like I had to go and get a casting for my hand, and I, I, I was thinking to myself, like, I had to go and put a cast out for my hand. And they'd done a whole cast on my hand for literally that much. Like that's that's what they'd done the casting for. Because in the film role, I got stabbed in the hand. I was it was, it was brilliant. I was 
Like I was in it for about maybe two and a half, three minutes, but to me that was like an hour, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I mean, watching it. Yeah. Like, I, it maybe took a couple of four or five hours to film. I would love to, be, I, I, I've got to be honest, I would love to get into to acting, but just like you, I'm not willing to go through the acting school no. and stuff. I would, if someone gave me an opportunity and it was the right thing, I would love, like to do it because I'm about building my own profile as well. Hence why I want to do a bit more boxing, carry on the podcasting, do a documentary, you know, all those kind of things. And I, I think it's a creative outlet, you know. I think I think it makes you feel good by doing it. Um, the thing about boxing is, it, 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 first of all, I've done it since I've been young. But secondly, I get fit training anyway. It's great to go to the gym. It's great to live healthy. You know, it, it helps in business. Trust it does, me, yeah. it, it helps a lot. Living healthy helps. Um, and acting, unfortunately, doesn't have those... Um, like it doesn't have those perks. You yeah. know, acting, you go to acting school, yes, okay, you're going to become a better actor. But realistically, I don't think, you know, unless you're aiming to be an actor, I'd, I'd say go and do it. If I'd done it from being young, I would still be pursuing it. Mm. Trust me, I think it's a brilliant career. I'd love to do it. But the thing is, obviously, we've all heard the expression, jack of all trades, master. And I am pretty much a jack of all trades. But I don't want to be a jack of all trades, master. And I want to be a jack of all trades, master of all of them. You know, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I know I can put the work in, but you know I can't do everything. But so, I'd love to act. So, um, what, what what's in store for you? Because you're, 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 you, I feel like you've got the world at your feet. I think you've got a great foundation. I think you've got the right mindset, got the right mentality. Obviously, in business, you know, you got everything. You know, what, where where is Alfie Best Junior going to be over the next five or ten years? What businesses are you going to flourish into? What are you going to do? Um, I like to stick only because what my uh, what my dad's taught me. We like to stick to what we know. And I like to do what I enjoy. Um, my watch business, if I'm not running that myself, it won't work. You know, that's the, you know, it's, it's something, it's very difficult to find someone you can trust to work there. It's, it's, it's not easy. And I'm happy running it myself. I meet some great, great people that other business comes from. You know, it's, it, you know, being in Hatton Garden, it's, it's like the heart of London. Mm. You see so, like, you know, you see so many people go there, come to my office, we can sit down, we can have a chat. And other business comes from that. That's why I love the watches for a start. And the mobile park homes, I'm going to grow that. That's uh, that's inevitable. That's going to happen if they come up and come about. Like, I'd say mobile park homes. I'm interested in property full stop. Yeah, me too. You know, property is great. I, I love it. Bricks and water, you can't go wrong, mm. you know. Um... So where do I see my... And other businesses, unless I, I know about them or I've got a partner that knows about it and, you know, it would have to be a real solid investment. Like, I'd have to know that it's going to work. Yeah. I don't like taking chances, especially if them chances come costly if they go wrong. Yeah. Um, so I'd see myself in 10... I'd, I'd like to say a multi-millionaire, even close to a billion. I'd, I'd aim for two or three billion. You know, the, the way I see it, reach for space, you'll hit the stars. And that's enough. Yeah, nice. You know? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, you've been around some really, really inspiring, high-profile people. You mentioned Billy Joe Saunders, obviously your dad being one of them, uh, Tyson Fury, and I've seen some of the posts that you've been with these people. Who would you say, by your dad, mm -hmm. sticks out and you think, you know what, that person or those group of people have absolutely inspired me to the next level? Uh, Inspiration-wise, uh, do they have to be travellers or can it be anybody on the Anybody. Planet? Anybody you want. Uh, what I met, like obviously yeah. I've been in the presence of. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I, to be quite honest with you, I don't, I don't think anybody probably quite tops me, Dad. You know what I mean? Because what, nice. what he's done is is, is amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't say this to his face too much because yeah, we, we don't live it down anyway. You know, it's there to see for yeah. everybody to see. Um, like I say, like we again, if you used to see, like I talk very highly, my dad, I love him very dearly, but you know. We're like businessmen. Like, there's no family crack. Do you understand? There's no, you know, how are you? It's how you been. How did you get on at work today? Have you done any deals? How are you getting on at your sites? Have you been on top of it? Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. It's never, oh, how are you? Blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, Alfie, thank you very much for this uh, conversation, mate. I'm going to wrap up here. When can, where can people find you? Instagram. Yeah. At Alfie underscore best. Cool. And your businesses, so people can look at it. At, at the best kettles. Yep. 
at the best kettles on Instagram and, the best and best kettles. park homes. Yeah, and best park homes. Yeah. One more question. Go so on. when I got into business, mm-hmm. I come up with a phrase, catchphrase, or like a mantra, and it goes like this: Be happy, never content. If I were to ask Alfie Best Junior what "be happy, never content" means to you, what that means to me is obviously be happy, but it's never enough. You always want to go further. Nice, I like that, mate. Thank you very much, everybody. This is going to be out in a few weeks' time. Uh, subscribe, like, comment, all the good stuff above. And once again, bro, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. No worries at all, Stephen. Cool. Thank you.